Hey guys, how are you? This is Russell Linville here. Hey, just checking in. Shoulder differential diagnosis. We're going to be talking about um, today looking at contractile tissue pathology. So trying to do our most common contractile tissue injuries or pathology. So when we think of contractile tissue, we think of muscle and tendon. And so with the shoulder, you can already see um, or maybe infer that we're going to be talking about some of the following. So some of the objectives here today, we're trying to understand the following differential diagnoses. Rotator cuff related shoulder pain. This is a big one. This is a bucket term, this RCRSP, um, that's come along the last couple of years to incorporate a lot of the different uh, uh, shoulder pain syndromes, if you will. So we think there's uh, rotator cuff impingement, uh, rotator cuff tears, or uh, even posterior internal impingement, slightly different. Um, but you know the the RCRSP, we we've tried to bucket this into impingement of the rotator cuff, uh, anything that's impinged or irritated in the subacromial space, in the coracochromial um, arch or the uh, bursa of the shoulder. So this is kind of a non-specific diagnosis, and treatments are all uh, pretty similar, uh, regardless of the anatomy here. Um, and we'll talk about that more as we go. Of course, uh, we'll talk about subscapularis, just the kind of the fourth rotator cuff muscle slash tendon. Um, we group that. Uh, it's an anterior, obviously anterior-based muscle, so it's got a little different mechanism of injury than the others. And then pec major tendon ruptures, and then we'll end with long head of the proximal biceps brachii tendinopathy. So you'll just commonly refer to this as the biceps tendon, but because there can be bicep tendon injuries at the elbow as well, we try to distinguish if it's uh, proximal or distal. And so when we go over elbow, we'll go over distal injuries as well. Okay, so let's talk about it. Uh, rotator cuff related shoulder pain first. So uh, description here, rotator cuff related shoulder pain describes dysfunction due to compression and abrasion of one or more of the rotator cuff tendons, the long head of the bicep tendon, and or the subacromial burst beneath the coracochromial arch. So obviously you'll need to know anatomy pretty well here. If we look at the picture on the right, um, you can see a side view, lateral view of the scapula, and um, you can see the chromium process and the coracoid process in this space that's above the glenoid but below these two bones. We'll fill this in with red here. This is your um, coracoacromial arch. And so there's a lot of tissues that live within this area, and you can see, um, yeah, we just labeled it here uh, for easy reference. But you have your uh, bursa of your shoulder, a couple different bursa, your um, your uh, long head of your bicep tendon comes off uh, the tip of your glenoid. You got uh, short head of your bicep comes off the coracoid process, pec minor as well. Obviously, this is the uh, the area that the supraspinatus sits, comes in and attaches to humeral head. Infraspinatus sits here. So you can see there's a lot of contributory factors here, as well as like superior labral issues as well. This is also known as subacromial impingement or subacromial bursitis or coracochromial impingement. So the coracochromial arch consists of the undersurface of the acromion, the coracochromial ligament, as well as the undersurface of the uh, AC joint. Impingement is most commonly diagnosed shoulder problem and likely has numerous potential mechanisms which can both uh, impact treatment and prognosis. Again, this is just a more dynamic picture as you can see here. If I've highlighted the coracochromial arch, um, you can see the infraspinatus muscle, subacromial bursa, acromion, supraspinatus muscle, biceps tendon, uh, and then the, some of the superior portion of the subscapularis uh, as well. And so these are all things that can get irritated under this space. So this table, you'll see this on many um, slides to come. We tried to make this easy for you guys to see. Again, um, some of the big ones here I'm going to highlight. This is for you to know. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and read all these off to you. Just That's just a heads up. The big ones we'll go over, though. So essentials of diagnosis. You know, when we're trying to diagnose rotator cuff-related shoulder pain, um, first thing is location. This is going to be more lateral-sided pain, usually going to show up at the, uh, the deltoid tuberosity. Um, so someone might refer to pain on the outside of their shoulder, nonspecific, uh, usually after repetitive overuse injury, uh, as you can see here, above 90 degrees. There could be um, capsular tightness, particularly a posterior cap capsule, and um, 
uh, the big one here is just repetitive overuse. And that's usually when we see things get irritated or inflamed. So general considerations here. This is the most common orthopedic shoulder problem. Uh, there's, we think there may be an acromial morphology component to this, although that's greatly debated, meaning um, the type of bony anatomy that you have, whether it's a flat, curved, or hooked acromion, may cause a uh, higher instance of rotator cuff impingement or irritation, uh, we think because it decreases space within the subacromial space or the coracoacromial arch. However, um, there's some studies that are out that say it has no uh, morphology has no bearing on uh, injury rates, things like that. We try to classify these as primary impingement syndromes or secondary impingement syndromes, meaning primary impingement generally occurs in patients ages 40 and older and is usually associated with degenerative changes to either rotator cuff tendons or um, things within the subacromial space. So we're thinking this is like primary tissues. Secondary impingement is actually a result of muscle imbalances, so we think more scapular dyskinesis. Uh, the, the shoulder blade is not moving appropriately, thus causing impingement on some of the tissues of the shoulder because uh, it's not sliding or gliding well, it's not posterior tilting appropriately, and so you get impingement. So diagnosis is usually made by clinical exam, and we'll talk about um, some of the special tests and the clinical exam as well. Secondary impingement usually occurs in people that are younger, you know, ages 15 to 35 that might have motor control issues um, or poor training uh, patterns. We move on here, signs and symptoms. Pain is in the anterior and I've uh, italicized lateral shoulder pain with active movements and activities overhead. There is a very commonly a painful arc, so the mid-range of shoulder elevation will be painful. Uh, the, the first half and the last half, or I guess you say the first third and last third, usually are not as uh, uncomfortable. Sometimes it still is, but maybe it's not the same extent. There's usually a, a, a barrier they get past and they feel a little better. So functional um, implications here. Pain and limitation with overhead activities uh, like reaching above shoulder height or behind the back, lifting, lifting weights, sustained or repetitive shoulder activities, and pain at night, especially rolling onto that side. They get irritation. So possible contributing causes. Again, maybe a chromium morphology, Degenerate changes at the AC joint, there could be bone spurs, things like that, that decrease subacromial space um, uh, around the AC joint, the distal clavicle or the acromion. And then you have rotator cuff tendinopathy, bicipital tendinopathy, capsular laxity, um, which just means there's more mobility in the shoulder so that space might decrease with uh, superior migration of the humeral head. Capsular tightness, especially posterior, there's something we call obligate translation. Uh, we'll get into that later. Uh, that might cause a little more impingement. And then a big one is scapular motor control issues, uh, i.e. winging of the scapula. But the, the two biggest possible contributing causes that I see in the clinic are repetitive overhead activities and poor neuromuscular control. Uh, as far as differential diagnosis, you're going to want to try to rule out the following. And um, you know, a lot of these, we think about the, um, the mechanism of injury. And so if you have someone with lateral shoulder pain that has no true mechanism of injury other than repetitive overuse or a spike in their workload, uh, we're thinking this rotator cuff-related shoulder pain um, or what we would call in shoulder impingement. Okay, but the differential diagnoses, the AC joint separation, cervical radiculopathy, refer referred pains from the lungs or diaphragm, full thickness rotator cuff tear, uh, glenohumeral arthritis or instability, labral tears, adhesive capsulitis, neuropathy, and internal impingement. And you know a lot of these you could, based on the mechanism that I described, you can quickly rule out. But some things like in an older individual, glenohumeral arthritis, that's more of a uh, kind of a global shoulder discomfort. You have to take age into consideration, some other factors. But um, you know most of this you guys should be on a practical, be able to to differentially diagnose. Uh, very good. So if we move on to uh, test and measures here, they're going to prevent with a painful arc sign, um, as we mentioned previously. Uh, another big one is the Hawkins-Kennedy test, which you can see is the first picture I've list, uh, 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 put on there. And then infraspinaeus muscle test as well. That's uh, the picture in the bottom right where this uh, examiner is uh, holding the arm up slightly into scaption and resisting external rotation. And so if it's painful with resisted external rotation, that would be a positive test. Um, weakness may uh, 
be a factor for a full thickness rotator cuff tear. So Nears impingement test as well, passive horizontal adduction test, meaning just bringing the arm across the body, pain with resisted abduction. I think there might be a sub, uh, supraspinatus uh, implication there. And then, of course, resisted full can or supraspinatus testing. So what does an intervention look like? Well, it varies depending on the type of impingement, uh, primary versus secondary, and where they're at in their stage of healing, etc. But in the acute stage, you're going to rest, maybe do ice or other modalities, and then really it's activity modification, so avoiding impinging positions. You want to tell these people that they can keep moving. It's, it's important that they stay active and allow their shoulder to keep um, being as functional as possible and whatever their pain-free ranges are. So that's what I tell my, uh, my patients. Uh, usually if you get outside what we call the shoulder box, which is kind of like a batter's box in baseball. Shoulder box, if I show you on this gentleman here, um, is from about from eye level to about shoulder width down to their thighs, right? This box, think of it as a three-dimensional box right in front of you. Usually if you stay within that box, um, you're not going to have an uh, increase in symptoms. And so you can do a lot of interventions in that area. So that, that's uh, the first thing. Then if you get into subacute or chronic stages um, of this diagnosis, you're going to address specific impairments. So glenohumeral hypomobility, you want to work on mobilization. If there's hypermobility, you work on stabilization. You want to work on rotator cuff strength, scapular strengthening. And again, activity modification is a big one here. These usually will resolve on their own. I think physical therapy um, is really good at helping it resolve quicker. But the natural history here is a few weeks shoulder discomfort. Um, you're going to be self-limited and usually will feel better. Okay. Sometimes you just can't get out of that, that cycle though. So if we talk a little deeper here to instead of rotator cuff related shoulder pain, we'll talk about what actually happens if there's a rotator cuff tear. Okay, so we look at two things with a rotator cuff tear. One is the length and one is the depth. So when we grade a rotator cuff tendon injury, I want you to think of this in the coronal plane. So looking at it, you know, in this plane of the shoulder. So if I had a rotator cuff tendon tear here, how much does it retract this way? Let's see if I get my little hand right here. Yeah, so that's one thing, that's the length. If you look at the MRI here, you can see the lateral portion of the shoulder, and then you can see the, the balls articulates with the glenoid. And this structure here is your supraspinatus tendon, and it should come all the way and attach to this area here. So this distance of this, the end of the tendons here, this black margin, this distance is the distance or the length that this tendon has torn. So when we think about um, grading these, we want to know if they're small to massive. And you can see the different centimeters listed there. Obviously, a, a good prognosis would be a one centimeter or less tear. And you start getting to medium, large, especially massive tears. You're talking about surgical intervention um, and that sort of thing. So depth, depth we think of as the thickness of the tendon and more of a like uh, superior to inferior uh, measure. So if I hold up my mouse here, so length would be this way, oh, this way, depth would be down this way, and so you can have a tear that's both long and deep, or you know, complete rupture, full thickness tear would be all the way through, and then sometimes that retracts back, and so that's where you get a difference in the length. So partial thickness uh, versus full thickness tearing. You want to know if they're articular sided, meaning joint sided tear or bursal sided tear single tendon or multiple tendons, and then there's, of course, differing shapes to different tears based on the mechanism of injury. And so this kind of outlines some of that. So you have your intrasubstance tear, meaning it's within the tendon uh, unit itself, the intrasubstance part of the tendon. You have a partial thickness humeral surface, or we would call this articular surface tear, right, because the joint is here, the articular, um, art articular means joint, so that sided tear would be here. A bursal surface tear would be here, and then a complete tear would be a tear through the entirety. And this, these can occur anywhere along the length of the tendon, of course. Here's a bird's eye view, similar thing, right? So I'll let you guys look over that. Here's just another um, picture to demonstrate this. You have tendinosis, so you can see fibers of the tendon are irritated, inflamed, and pissed off. Partial thickness tear, you can see it's starting to retract. We call this an articular sided tear. Uh, it's starting to retract off the bone here. It's not quite full thickness like this one where it's completely ruptured and retracted. There's a study in 2005 by Park et al. 
It's a good study. It looks at all the special tests of shoulder impingement and their predictive value. And so if um, we click through some slides here, what we're going to want to look at here is this picture on the bottom left. One is Nears and then one is the Hawkins Kennedy test, as you guys can see. But for a full thickness rotator cuff tear, there's going to be um, a painful arc, a drop arm sign, and an infraspinatus muscle test sign, meaning pain with external rotation resisted. And then for just overall impingement, which what we consider is a rotator cuff related shoulder pain um, based on this lecture, you're going to have a positive Hawkins Kennedy, a positive painful arc, and then also an infraspinatus muscle test. But if you look at the top there in the areas I didn't highlight, Nears impingement sign is really good for picking up um, partial thickness rotator cuff tears as well as bursitis. So that should be part of your, um, your repertoire of special tests. But, you know, if we look at these two, the only thing different, right, painful arc, good, infraspinatus test, the only thing different is Hawkins-Kennedy. So if you can just remember painful arc and resisted external rotation, then full thickness rotator cuff tear, we'd expect weakness, right? So you'd have a drop arm sign, meaning um, you're not able to uh, resist uh, or hold your arm up because of secondary to weakness because there's a muscle tear. Meanwhile, overall impingement syndrome, we think nears impingement sign, plus all of these Hawkins Kennedy's impingement signs. So um, there you have it. Really good test. Of course, um, has great positive predictive value. Likelihood ratios are well above, you know, 1.0 would be considered good. This is 10 times that and 15 times that as well. So um, pretty, pretty great. So what's posterior or internal impingement then? This is still working with rotator cuff, uh, however, in a different area. So Posterior impingement is also called internal impingement. You'll, you'll see it written both ways. Uh, it refers to rotator cuff or labral impingement between the glenohumeral joint at maximum external rotation and 90 degrees of abduction. So we think uh, uh, throwing sports. So this is hyper degree of abduction, external rotation, um, and horizontal abduction. So uh, what happens is the joint just gets pinched. This is a normal occurrence, and actually there's MRI study that looks at um, a functional MRI say it looks at uh, asymptomatic individuals putting their arm in that throwing position and max layback here is what we call sort of the cocking phase of throwing and you're going to get natural asymptomatic uh, quote unquote impingement so those tissues do get compressed whether you have pain or not but unfortunately uh, when this phrase you know, enough or, or is pinched enough or there's a high spike in workload, these tissues can get irritated um, and uh, you start having discomfort. So it really is about activity modification. So this is the site of impingement between superior posterior glenoid and the rim of the humeral head. Pain is directly located posteriorly. So when you take this person back in this position, they complain of pain and pinching in the back of their shoulder. I mentioned earlier we talked about obligate translation. So this is going to be um, something you'll learn about as time goes on. We'll touch on it here. Here's the face of your glenoid. Okay. Here's the center of axis that your humeral head spins on. When you go into the max cocking phase, so external rotation of the shoulder at 90 degrees of abduction, there's a slide and glide that occurs um, superior and posterior. Okay. We can see that's that's here. So what what occurs then is the humeral head shifts posteriorly and superiorly, and so it creates a a um, position of contact between the humeral head and the superior posterior rim of the glenoid. And this is usually because there's a uh, tight posterior capsule. And if there's a tight posterior capsule, uh, essentially what happens is you can't translate posterior enough, so you start translating superior, and you get this pinch in the, or you can get this pinch, this posterior impingement that occurs. So overhead athletes have a unique range of motion characteristics compared to non-overhead athletes. So in throwers, we see total arc of rotational differences, and swimmers are t typically very hypermobile. So things to consider on your exam, and we'll go over this briefly, is total arc of motion, cross-body mobility, and lat flexibility, horizontal uh, abduction mobility. So we can see here external rotation, internal rotation. This is called a total arc of motion. In throwers, this is maybe someone normal. This is maybe a thrower who has more external versus internal. And again, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it's hard to calculate. Just know some of these um, positions of baseball players, especially, will get really high um, ranges of motion to external rotation. We think it 
um, causes some of this posterior impingement diagnosis. So again, a brief touch on what we would call humeral retrotorsion, uh, sometimes just referred to as torsion of the shoulder, is baseball players, as they're growing, their, their bony anatomy adapts to throwing. So um, if there's a baseball player in class, you can kind of test this on yourself, right? Your right arm will be able to lay back really far, and your, you can see me, your left arm or your non-throwing arm won't be able to rotate as far. And this is because of bony abnormality along the long axis of the bone. And so in baseball players, um, uh, you have more external rotation at rest, even though the humeral head is centered um, bilaterally. This is, a, this is an advanced concept to learn, and I don't expect you to really understand it, but just know that this kind of plays into your humeral or your posterior impingement. So to give you guys a brief look at what total arc of motion, range of motion testing looks like, this is me in the clinic uh, with a swimmer, and we get them, this person is supine, we have them uh, on the table here, and we're externally rotating their arm as far as possible passively um, to see if they get any symptoms. And this was at the end of um, this person's rehab. Of course, this is a tremendous amount of external rotation. It's got nearly 100 and 60 degrees of external rotation, so um, she's a hypermobile individual, as you can see. So we go external rotation is 160. We look at internal rotation, so we block the scapula, and then I have a partner helping me, but we'll measure internal rotation. That's 50. That gives us a total arc of motion of 210, which is very high. Um, I'd be very, I'm very concerned with this person's shoulder stability. Uh, so anyways, long story short, a normal range is about 160 to 180, uh, so you want to normalize that to the other side. So we don't look at internal side-to-side -side, um, range or external side-to-side. -side. We look at uh, normalizing the total arc of motion. The other things you should look at is posterior capsule tightness. So you block the shoulder blade, you start um, doing a cross-body test, and this might show you that their posterior capsule, posterior shoulder is tight. You measure it in the picture in the bottom right. Same thing with lat or shoulder flexion range of motion. Take them in, you block their shoulder blade and then take them to a degree of scaption or flexion overhead and see um, how far their, their arm is and then it's how you would measure it. So these are some different things. And then baseball players especially, we think that horizontal um, abduction, hyper horizontal abduction uh, creates this posterior impingement effect as well. So we get you know, on the edge of the table and we try to measure uh, how much range of motion you have if we go back, and you can see this individual just has a, a lot of this hyper-horizontal abduction, base, college baseball player here in the cities. So how do we test for posterior impingement? Well, we use other tests for, for um, we use the test from um, shoulder instability to figure this one out. So we use the apprehension sign. So we maximally externally rotate the shoulder. If you get posterior pain, um, this is in a 90 degree position, then in, in the posterior pain that pinches, we go, okay. Then we do a relocation sign, so we, we provide a downward force on the humeral head, and then we take you into the max layback, so we provide a posterior glide. That might, and usually what happens is that decreases your, your um, complaints of pinching, and so uh, that's a good sign. <clears throat> if there's pain with um, hyper-horizontal abduction off the edge of the table, there's pain with end range of motion, ER at 90. And then really tests and measures we're looking, uh, is there something called a Bennett's lesion, which is repetitive, um, this is like a pincer deformity almost, uh, like we see in the hip. So Bennett's lesion is bony overgrowth at the rim of the uh, glenoid um, from repetitive contact. And then in uh, chronic cases, you're gonna do uh, assess labral pathology, rotator cuff tearing, et cetera. So posterior impingement, you know, activity modification, you know, and, and then the rest is what we do for normal rotator cuff stuff, right? And then eventually there's a return to sport phase, gradual exposure to plyometrics, interval throwing program or interval swimming program or interval, interval sports program to guide them back to sports. Now let's talk about subscapularis tendinopathy. If I'm going too fast, just of course pause at any time um, and go from there. So subscapularis, tears of the subscap, uh, occur usually with a sudden forceful external rotation or extension applied to an abducted arm. This is usually a Fouche type of injury. Uh, the main complaint is pain and range of motion may be uh, maintained or even increased. 
uh, into external rotation. But on exam, the patient will have increased yeah, passive external rotation with shoulder adducted at the side and weakness of internal rotation. MRI and ultrasound will confirm treatment should include immediate surgical repair in most cases. So here's kind of what I've already mentioned. But in a study by Mall et al., uh, if we look here, mechanism of injury uh, was fall into outstretched arm or anterior shoulder dislocation, a very traumatic one like in a car accident where the humeral head gets pushed forward in the joint and tears the not only the labrum but also the subscapularis. Um, and then the arm taken into horizontal abduction or external rotation. So you're going to have loss of uh, internal rotation, anterior shoulder pain, and ecchymosis may be present. Other considerations, though, is the supraspinatus is involved in 84% of tears of the subscapularis and infraspinatus in about 40%. And subscapularis tears were present in 78% of injuries in this study. So tear size, um, we can see there if you refer to tear size in the previous uh, uh, slides here. The average active forward elevation improved from 81 to 150 degrees post-operatively. So we think there's um, uh, a need for surgery in these cases. Average patient age in this study was 54 uh, years old and reported mean time of surgical intervention of 66 days, anywhere from 3 to 48 weeks from the time of injury. So traumatic rotator cuff tears are more likely to occur in relatively young, largely male patients who suffer a fall or trauma, abducted externally rotated arm. Your differential diagnosis here, and this is this picture on the right is this third one, this anterior shoulder dislocation. You can see the uh, humerus has has gone antero inferior. You can see this big sulcus sign. This is an anterior shoulder dislocation, but that's going to be one of your differential diagnosis, along with a pec major or a lat dorsi tendon tear, rotator cuff tendon injury, injuries, or um, even neurological conditions. So it's subscapularis tear tests and measures. You have your lift off test, the picture on the left and then your belly press test, the picture on the right, but also want to look at what we call an internal rotation lag sign, which is in Dutton, and a bear hub test as well. Imaging is going to be important for uh, figuring this one out. Intervention, so, um, you know, if you do a wait-and-see approach, a non-operative approach, rehab principles apply. So stage of healing, patient's tolerance, wishes, and goals, graded exposure to stimulus, slow, gradual return to high-level activities, and if conservative treatment fails, surgery may be recommended. Uh, if there's traumatic complete tear, surgery is recommended right away to preserve function long term. Uh, Post-operative physical therapy for subscapularis repair is initiated and you really got to know about concomitant procedures because again, 85% have a supraspinatus tear, 40% have an infraspinatus tear, so it's probably going to be uh, not only a subscapularis repair but also a rotator cuff repair. So you just want to use caution here with loaded resisted internal rotation. You don't want to stress the tissues too soon. And then a caution with external rotation, stretching, or range of motion because that will put tension through the subscapularis, as you know. Now let's look at pec tendon ruptures. So first of all, just look at the pictures on the right. Usually this is how it happens. This There's a famous uh, video that was going around. This guy's bench pressing, and you know he's got five plates on it doing incline bench. Really massive guy. Obviously, um, probably on the juice, on the, uh, the, uh, the gear, if you will. So, uh, you know, he's getting spotted. However, what happens is his is uh, pec tendon fails on the eccentric or the negative portion of this movement. And you can see that he has this big muscle rupture. And this is mid-video where you get this big um, retraction of the pec muscle. So very apparent uh, in this individual. And so if you're looking for that video, it's very easy to find. Just, I don't know, type in pec tendon tear, something like that, uh, incline bench. This is the guy afterwards. You can see now um, he's got these signs and symptoms, obviously, of a post-pec injury, big ecchymosis, bruising, swelling, uh, and most of all, upset face. Anyways, uh, as we move on here, everything I just mentioned is pretty much right here. This mechanism of injury is usually um, due to uh, uh, hyper stretching or hypertension, not blood pressure, but hyper tensioning of the uh, of the pec tendon. And so uh, usually in the negative eccentric portion of the movement. So we move on here. Essentials of diagnosis. This is a relatively rare condition, but in certain population groups like rugby players, football players, and weightlifters, it's it's common. 
So, which is why it's here, because you guys will be working with a lot of active individuals. So diagnosis is made um, through history and clinical exam, MRI for confirmation, uh, usually from a sudden high force, typically weightlifting, may, may arise from repetitive type activity, but you know, I, don't, I haven't seen many, much of that. Sudden pain or tearing sensation in the chest may be experienced, you might feel a pop or hear a pop. Uh, you're going to have swelling, ecchymosis, functional pain. Treatment may depend on location of the rupture. And so demographics, it's more common in men between the ages of 20 and 50 that participate in both contact sports and or weightlifting. And uh, we think there's a contribution here of anabolic steroid use. So chronic steroid use may degrade tendon health over time um, and lead to something like this. So this is a picture on the right of an individual who's torn their tendon um, and not gotten surgery. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you can see how the muscles retracted there. But signs and symptoms, there's an audible snap or pop at the time of injury, sudden pain or tearing sensation, uh, mild swelling or ecchymosis. And obviously, um, this could be more mild in a, in a partial tear and, and more severe swelling and ecchymosis in a, on a complete tear. Loss of uh, normal pectoralis contour and then weakness with horizontal shoulder adduction. So functional implications are going to have limited pushing, weight training is going to be limited, overactivities of course limited, and inability to lift heavy objects. So possible contributing causes, uh, you can see listed here, of course steroid use is one of them, um, and I do have patients that have admitted to me of using steroids, so you will have that occasionally, and the main thing is don't, um, don't judge them for that. Your, your job is to help them, it's not to uh, scold them or anything like that. So we can, if you guys have questions about that and how I approach things like that, just ask me. Um, I always tell them don't do it, uh, but you know it's their life. So forceful eccentric activity, and then of course often seen in, in football injuries. And this is a guy named Anthony Barr. Uh, he's a football player for the Vikings. Well known. He had a pec uh, muscle tear last season, 2020. And it would happen something like this, where his arm's outstretched and he's trying to make a tackle. He grabs onto someone's jersey and then his arm gets pulled behind him like that as the player runs through it. And so it's this hyper horizontal uh, abduction moment. Uh, differential diagnosis, you're going to try to rule out long head of the biceps, tendon rupture, shoulder dislocations, proximal humerus fractures, rotator cuff tendon tears, or nerve entrapment syndromes. Tests and measures, really imaging is the, the Number one thing here, you're going to have this big, sharp pain, maybe retraction of the muscle. You know something's up. It's not hard to diagnose this. So radiographs, see if there's any bony, like avulsion fractures, and of course MRI. Special test, you know, pretty obvious. Loss of strength with horizontal adduction, pain with horizontal abduction, range of motion. Ecchymosis is bruising and is present. So interventions, non-operative, you're going to ice. Uh, modalities in the acute stages, activity modification, operative, you're going to try to follow post-operative protocol for pec major tendon repairs, caution with passive external rotation, scaption, elevation, horizontal abduction, those all put the pec tendon on tension, and then caution with resisted loaded internal rotation, horizontal adduction and extension, again, those activate the tendon and put stress through it. And finally, here our last thing, so think, thanks for sticking with me. I try to make these about 30 minutes long. This is going to go a little over. Proximal long head of the biceps, brachii tendinopathy. It's a mouthful. We just say proximal biceps tendon issues. So description here, it's inflammation, irritation, or swelling of the proximal long head of the bicep, also referred to as biceps tendonitis. Uh, occurs most often in repetitive motion injuries or impingement syndrome, but can occur with sudden strain or stress of the tendon. So early stages, you can see here in late stages, there's a little differences. If there is a rupture, you will get what's called a uh, Popeye deformity, which is um, when the tendon ruptures, the muscle belly retracts down the arm, and you have this bulging muscle, uh, this bulge, I should say, at the bottom of the uh, the distal portion of the humerus. And we'll talk about that more. Popeye deformity is more with uh, the elbow. So essentials of diagnosis, definitely want to get a history and clinical exam, and then look for signs and symptoms with active and passive range of motion, resistance, palpation, specific tests for the biceps tendon. Um, pain is going to be usually at the bicipital groove with just tendonitis. So if we're, if we're just thinking about a tendinopathy instead of a rupture, the bicipital groove is going to be very tender. And uh, pain will be uh, present with passive stretch of the biceps. So we're talking about shoulder extension. All right, let's see if I can 
shoulder extension, elbow extension, supination. All those put max tension um, or stretch through the biceps, and so it may be irritating. General considerations, there, there's usually a history here of repetitive motion, especially overhead, common in swimming, tennis, baseball, other occupational um, activities involving repetitive or overhead activity. Uh, so there you go. Demographics is predominantly individuals with repetitive activities in sports, uh, overhead athletes, manual laborists, that sort of thing. Signs and symptoms, you can see the picture on the right is direct palpation to the uh, bicipital groove. And so that's the third bullet down uh, on this list. But they're going to have ache in the anteromedial, medial, anterior lateral aspect of the shoulder. It worsens with overhead lifting or activity. Um, Pain is going to be with resisted elbow flexion or resisted forward flexion of the shoulder. And also uh, resisted supination. Um, it's a big one. So pain with passive stretch of the bicep, as we mentioned before. And then positive special test for the, the biceps. Functional limitations, you're going to have overhead activities limited, throwing, and other rapid arm movements. Possible contributing causes, well, the, the first one is just repetitive overuse. Um, that's the big one. And so that's just like, uh, you know, your rotator cuff-related shoulder pain. Um, these are treated very similarly, and that's why the differential diagnosis you can see on the right has a lot of those there. But you also want to rule out something like a labral tear or a, uh, what we consider as a slap tear, a superior labrum, anterior to posterior tear, which we'll go over in a different lecture with the inert structures. So you can um, pause this and look at these more if you want. So tests and measures um, from left to right, uh, top to bottom row is the test that I've highlighted, Jurgensen's test, um, which is a resisted test. Speed's test, again, that's a resisted test. O'Brien's test, re it's that's resisted. We also call that the active compression test. And then a pronated load test. So you take the person into max external rotation with pronation, and you resist elbow flexion. If that hurts, we think there's a biceps um, issue as well. That's also a test for slap tears. So here's some other tests that you can do. I'll, uh, I'll let you look those up. And then um, some questionnaires, the, sp the spady and the quick dash. Interventions, very similar here to rotator cuff related shoulder pain. Uh, big one here is just rest. So a lot of these are self limiting, and the natural history is pretty short, you know, two to three weeks, and then they can start loading again, getting back into it. So, um, our job is just make sure we get their pain under control. We teach them in patient education. But some of the things that you see on the right are good for it. I wouldn't do direct, pal direct um, lacrosse ball to the biceps tendon until we're a little later out, but you could hit pec major and some of the tissues around there. Um, usually direct palpation is just pretty painful, so no real point in doing that until a little later on. But then again, you're going to work on scap and motor control exercises and mobility, thoracic spine, scapular exercise. So uh, eventually eccentric bicep strengthening if it's appropriate for that individual. So <clears throat> I want to just say thank you to you guys. This lecture went a little longer than I wanted uh, by a couple minutes, but um, Appreciate your time. Shoot me a message or email if you have any questions. And I uh, hope everything's going well. Look forward to uh, talking to you guys soon. Thanks.